So let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. How, was How is Easter? How is Easter? Good. Do you notice that in our liturgical books we never call it Easter? Resurrection. Resurrection. Do you notice that in our prayers? We call it Pasch or Passover. So where do we get Easter from? <laughs> Google it. <laughs> Google it, yeah. yeah. It has its history. It, but, but it's properly called the Passover. Because Christ it passes over from death to, to life. Just as the Hebrews passed over from bondage to freedom. Uh -huh. So it's called the Passover okay, of the Lord. So this is the one year uh, four that were furthest away from the actual Jewish Passover. They don't celebrate it the, near the end of next month. So, so that's uh, so we celebrate the Passover. Very, very you know, important uh, time in the his, in the liturgical calendar of the church. And always remember that um, because it is uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, our liturgies are. If you look at the early church, how they celebrated the liturgies, you know, today we say, oh, we, we, they had time. You know, they, they had things to do too. Okay? So, you, you look at all this week, okay? it's called an octave. So, every day is a feast. Remember when they celebrated the Passover, they just, it was a whole week of festivities. So that's how it's supposed to be, an octave. That's why you notice all this week, we pray the Gloria okay, every day. Because okay? it's a festive week. But you know, what, what happens is that people come Easter Sunday and then... That's it. Come back next Easter. Yeah. <laughs> and then we are, we are done. So in, in Mexico, the kids actually get two weeks off for Easter, mm -hmm. for the Passover. They can celebrate and go to church and everything. Yeah, it's a wonderful, you know, big, big celebration. Yeah. But they, they always to remember what we're, I think we talked about this earlier, but always remember that what we are celebrating on Easter is, why we celebrate a new creation. But what is a new creation? Christ died, and Christ rose, therefore. Yeah, in order to understand the new creation, you have to relate it to the old. Okay. Adam. So what is what about the old that we needed the new? Adam, Adam and Eve committed a sin. So Jesus had to come back, come into this world to. So the most important thing Adam. about Easter is to remember that we are celebrating. The reason we are we should be joyful <coughs> is because we are being re. Reborn? <coughs> Liberation Liberate. from sin. We are liberated. Okay? The Jewish people, the <coughs> Hebrews, rejoiced when they crossed the Red Sea. Okay? When they crossed the Red Sea, the Egyptians couldn't follow anymore. They were dead in the waters of the river. So they sang the Easter hymn. It was like the Passover hymn. Okay? Liberation from sin. So sin is now defeated, now we are free. That is what Easter is about. So as we said, if I really didn't go to confession during Lent, there is really no point for me to celebrate Easter. Why? Because Easter is celebration, liberation from sin, freedom from sin. But... With which ones? I didn't do anything about my sins. 
So what am I liberated from? Why should I rejoice about Easter? And of course, these celebrations will go all the way to Pentecost. A very important day, you know, when, but it's a, it's a wonderful festival celebration, liberation from sin. Okay? So it's, very, it's a big, big disservice in the church today, whereby in many circles, sin is never mentioned. We just talk about, oh, God's mercy, God is merciful, God is love. Why would, why would I need God's mercy? That's what one, one of the atheists, you know, wrote a blog, or he has a blog on whatever on the internet. He blasted Pope Francis. We he's a gay man. He, he's homosexual, whatever. He said, we don't need your mercy. <laughs> we don't need your mercy. Why? They don't believe in Because there's, there's no sin. Yeah. So why would I need mercy? I didn't do anything. So if as church we don't really emphasize that there is sin we need to we need to be freed from and simply talk of love, mercy and whatever, okay? and simply say, Oh God is love, God is mercy, God is whatever. But just think about this. Okay? Pope Benedict explains it so well that if sin were to be ignored, God would have done it. But he didn't. He addressed it. Sin must be addressed. But how did God address it? How did God address sin? He died on the cross. We don't have any cross in here. Okay, it's hidden. It's hidden from you. Only from you. It's hidden from me. I mean, just to think about that. Okay? Sin must be addressed. It cannot be ignored. And the way the Father addressed it is by giving up his son. Or the son giving himself freely okay? in his divinity. Okay? He gave himself freely. But that is the cross, is how God addresses human sin. So it's something serious, extremely serious, that just think about this God. God becoming man and taking upon himself my sins. Because, you know, we don't see the total picture. God sees the total picture. God sees the immense evil of sin, the wrath, the nature of sin, the grave nature, the evil of sin. God sees it all. We don't. And when Jesus Christ saw the evil that sin can unleash upon us humans, what happened to him? He trembled. He was afraid. Can you imagine? God, true God, a true man, was afraid of sin. So I have to ask ourselves, am I afraid of sin? We should be. We should be, but am I? I mean, if God who sees the total picture and where sin can basically land at, where sin can get us, saw that whole wrath basically directed toward him and he trembled. Okay. How much more should I tremble? before my sins, but unfortunately we, we don't. So that's why we have to ask the Holy Spirit to teach us again, to understand the evil of sin and the goodness of being with God. So sin is not a joke. I think some of you probably by now you have seen this uh, commercial of uh, Ronald Reagan, the son of Ronald Reagan. You haven't seen it. So it appears on like a CNN, MSNBC. Maybe the last time I saw it was on Fox or whatever. It was about money, okay? But he's basically, they have a group of atheists. They have an organization, okay? And so they are fighting freedom, basically to remove religion from the state, okay? You know, that total separation, don't talk about whatever. But as he concludes the commercial, 
He says, by the way, I'm not afraid of burning in hell forever. That's He's an atheist. Goes. Why does he believe even in hell? Because, because it's a mockery. He's mocking those ah. who believe in hell. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> by the way, I'm not afraid of burning in hell forever. Michael Reagan? He's called Ronald Reagan, the son of... Oh, Ronald. The, yes, the Ronald, dancer. the son. Yeah. Oh. The son of Ronald Re oh. Reagan, yes. Yeah. Wow. Okay. He's a prominent atheist. Oh, wow. Oh, Nancy So just imagine, just imagine, okay, that you are Jesus. Just imagine what Jesus Christ did for us, okay? He knows where sin can get us. He knows the powers of evil. He knows the suffering of hell. He knows it. That's why he came to snatch us out of the grip of the evil one, to lead us to, to glory, to heaven. But just imagine he died for every one of us. Our sins were there when he was suffering in the garden of Gethsemane. When he was sweating blood, our sins were there. Okay. How? It's very important to always remember what we said. Okay. That so that's what we call Easter joy. Okay. Easter joy has to be put in context okay, of what we are joyful about. We said that whatever Whatever he did, mm -hmm. did for our salvation participates in divine eternity, meaning that to God there is no yesterday, tomorrow, or next, whatever. Okay? To God all time is one. It is the divine now. Okay? That's why his divine now pervades past, present, and future. Okay? So to God there is no all now in a billion years from today there will be people, I don't, I wonder how they will look like. Okay? God doesn't have that. To him, all time is one because he is eternal. Okay? So to him, time is one. For us, it's just, you know, it's not. But to him, all time is one. So because Jesus Christ is true God and a true man, therefore, whatever he did for our salvation particip participates in that divine eternity, the divine now. Meaning that whenever his divinity is, there is his humanity. Okay? And so, because to him all time is one, my sins could be there in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was taking upon himself the entire weight of human sinfulness. <clears throat> because to him, 2,000 years from that act is now. It was there. For me in time, I'm just entering into it. Okay? But it is already there. It is. So he won my forgiveness there in the garden, on the cross. That's when I was forgiven. Okay? Right now I'm just receiving that forgiveness. Like when I go to confession, when I celebrate the Eucharist, I'm just receiving the forgiveness that was given to me by Christ when he actually in time and space suffered and died for me. So my sins were there. It's not that Jesus didn't know about them. Okay. So just to think about this, that you are that God okay, who did that for each and every one. Okay. And then you see people whose sins you carried upon yourself, celebrating their sinfulness. You want forgiveness for them through tremendous suffering. And they are born in time now, but you just want them to receive that forgiveness. You want for them at such a cost at such a price. And they look at you and they say, I'm not afraid of burning in hell forever. 
and they go and make parades to celebrate their sinfulness. And not only that, but to ask your body to accept a sin as the right way to live. That the disease you suffered to uproot, someone is saying, oh no, that's the right way. Jesus, you were just uh, you know, misguided. This is who we are, this is what we want to do, this is our life. Just to ponder, think about that. But Father, <clears throat> wouldn't atheists uh, come out with this, uh, but how do you know? How do you know he's going to burn in hell? How do you know he's going to? How do you know I'm not going to burn in hell? They always come up with an answer. Mm -hmm. they, they don't Why? Because they refuse to see the obvious, Romans chapter 1. But it makes you kind of wonder, you know, wouldn't it? That's the obstinacy of the human heart, okay? okay? That a person denies what is obvious. St. Paul says, okay, they are capable of understanding it because he made it understandable to them. But they refuse to understand. I mean, just imagine a person who just refuses to acknowledge that they have a soul, something within them which is not matter. Or, we are not going very far, that's going too far. A person who acknowledges, a human being, okay, who refuses to acknowledge that a child in the womb is a human being. But we're not talking about atheists. We're talking about people who profess to be Catholic, mm -hmm. people who profess to be Christians, who are not Christian at all. They're just the practical atheists who call themselves Christians. I mean, just to think about that, okay? Because if one says, okay, let's... God, we can't see him, we can't know there's a hell, we can't know there's a whatever, okay? Okay, let's put that aside for a moment. Can't we know how a human being is formed? And how we come to be? I'm here because I was conceived in the womb of my mother. At the first, whatever you want to call it, a microsecond or whatever you want to call it. That's how I began to be. Why do rational human beings deny that? <clears throat> so it's a deliberate blindness to realities. Yeah? We can even begin with what we can actually see. Okay? Just to think about it, the practice, you know, sodomy. Okay? Sodomy. Okay? So, sodomy, that, that scene of sodomy. A man sleeping with a man, a woman sleeping with a woman in a sexual kind of, you know, situation, okay? And someone, not only saying that, well, it, it can be done, but now let's bring it to the center of society that we give it the status of marriage. How can humans do that? They can't, but they do. You know? <clears throat> okay. So denying the very reality of who we are, okay, like for me this is the, the essence of it. Humanity, we, have, we are progressing toward the future. But if, for example, you accept that, you know, homosexual marriage, okay, the so-called homosexual marriage, then what is the future of humanity? Nothing. You ain't going to have it again. What is the future? It's going to disappear. Where, where is the future going to come from? It's going to disappear. The godless delusion. <laughs> a rat is a, a rat is a pig is a big boy. <laughs> okay. But they think we are deluded. So that's what happens to humans when there is absence of God. The the devil. The, this is so uh, it's so clear to a believer, to a person who has a brain. Okay. How can you say? that we are progressing toward the future if you have blocked everything that leads you to a meaningful future. Like homosexuality, the practice of homosexuality. Where is the future of humanity with that? How many of us would be here if our parents practiced that 40 years ago, 50 years ago? 72 years ago. Okay. But how can, you, how can a person accept that and believe it? How? 
that that is the future. That's what we must embrace. This is good for us. So that answers all that. Mm -hmm. Because when a person rejects, rejects God, the presence of God, the existence of God, whatever, you reject the very essence of who you are. And all these things are basically the rejection of humanity. Okay. Rejection of human dignity. Abortion is a very, very living example, good example of that. And you have so many Catholics even today, many Catholics, again. Okay. And some of them, you know, amuse me, you know, not in a good way. <laughs> when they say that I'm a credo Catholic. I'm a credo Catholic. Cafeteria style. But I have other issues I need to consider when I'm voting for a politician. Abortion is not the only thing I have to look at. There are many other issues I have to put into consideration. How are you able to put those other issues into consideration? Because you were not aborted. Because someone gave you a chance to life. That's how you are able to consider those other issues. Otherwise, if there is no life, there is no issue to consider. Okay? That's why we talked about, about, about mass. Okay? Do, do really many Christians, do we really know Christ? Because it's very disturbing for a Catholic to say okay, that I don't care about abortion. There are other burning, pressing issues that our nation needs to consider. Immigration, the economy, the whatever, and everything. <laughs> but what good, if we talk about like the economy, what good are social programs if there are no people to enjoy them? <laughs> what good is immigration if you don't have Anybody migrants? Mm -hmm. yeah, if they are dead, what good, what good is it? But that's what happens with humans when so, so, as we celebrate, you know, this liberation from sin, okay, we have also to recognize the entrenchment of sin. Not only in this social whatever we talk about, but in our lives. Whereby sin doesn't really scare us. But it scared the Son of God, who is God. So when we sin, we should be fearful. That's the only thing we should be afraid of. You know, people talk about ISIS, terrorism, and whatever. You know, <laughs> all those things are there, and they are evil. Okay? But the way it is on the top of everything, it is political. It has nothing to do with human concern, or there is little to do with human concern. Because if these so-called politicians who are so much concerned about terrorism, San Bernardino, how many people died? Hmm? 14. Okay. In, Brass, in France, how many people died? 130, 132. Hmm? In um, Brussels, how many people died? 35. Mm, probably more will die. Okay? And those are things that are so abominable. Okay? Because you just think about this. People, you are in a uh, terminal, going to fly somewhere, and someone shows up just for the purpose of killing people. Just for the purpose of just killing people. They didn't do anything to you. You don't know who they are. But you go and I will die killing them. Just to think about that. That's a, a human being created by God, but that's their heart. Talk about you know, demonic powers. That's what it is. Demonic powers. You don't even know these people. You look at them right there, but you see them as objects of death, 
objects to kill. Because you don't value your own life. So other people's lives have no meaning. You know, that's, if you really think about terrorism, that's what it is. It's scary in that sense. But there is a, war, a worse form of terrorism going on, abortion, which these people who shout about the terrorism are supporting, like Hillary Clinton and many others. Okay? But we can give her as an example. Okay? Who said, uh, and Don Trump too, Planned Parenthood is doing a good job for women. Don Trump even lied and said, well, the abortions in Planned Parenthood is only 3%. That's what he said. Abortion makes up only 3%. But, but I'll, I'll define it, I'll define it. Okay? But they do a lot of good work for women. He's a liar. They do a lot of good job for women. Abortion is only 3%. But I will define it. Okay? But I'll define it for that. But they do a lot of good work. What good work? Ben Carson, you know, said it well. He's a doctor, he knows. That everything Planned Parenthood does is done elsewhere. Any woman can go anywhere except for abortion. Okay? Any woman can go anywhere and receive what Planned Parenthood does. So he said we don't need it. It's probably better. Because so that's so called women's health they do. If any woman can get it anywhere else. <clears throat> but we continue to give them money because they supply what other health care, whatever they can supply, namely abortion. The worst form of terrorism. Because as I said, the other terrorists kill people they don't know. But in abortion, we kill people we know. We kill our own. Not 35, not 130, not 14, millions. but millions. millions. The devil is a liar. Okay? Look at you know some people, including many Catholics, are deceived. Because the statist statistics show that before it was about 1.5 1.6 million a year in the U.S. And then you hear these people say, oh, it's getting better. Okay? The country is becoming pro-life, everything. Because, why? Because now we have 1.3 million abortions a year from 1.6, 1.52, 1.3. Things are very well. Pro-life is winning. Because now it is only, only 1.3 million. Only? Who supplies those statistics? The devil. The one who kills. So, do you expect the devil to tell you the truth? No. Do you expect to plan the parenthood to tell you the truth that we killed these many children? That we did this, these many abortions? If they say... Have you ever heard any Planned Parenthood person say that we are providing abortions for women? Never. What do they say? Providing health care. Women's health care. They never say we provide abortions. <coughs> Why? And so you expect them to give you statistics about what they do, how many children they kill. So we shouldn't be deceived. That the devil is going to tell us the truth. Smoking years. Except for that one, was it president that was eating lunch and all these baby parts she was selling, aborted baby mm -hmm. parts. But because she didn't know that she was being recorded. <coughs> okay. So, so really, um, that's why you know we talk about Christ liberating us from sin. Mm -hmm. But you know, as we know, sin is very much alive. Okay? So we have to really ponder this. As I, we said, you know, sometimes the church will preach us do a disservice when we ignore sin completely. And the devil loves that. Because if there is no sin to address, then there is no need for conversion. 
And so we can't just say, oh, we're celebrating Easter, you know. Oh, Easter bunnies and eggs. <laughs> Can you imagine that's what Easter is? Easter eggs and bunnies and whatever. The devil loves those things. When we begin, we ourselves will begin to mock the very realities of our salvation. Easter eggs. The Easter bunny. What are those things? <laughs> Commercialization. <laughs> As they did with Christmas. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, sin must be addressed. Sin cannot be ignored. God doesn't ignore sin. We shouldn't ignore it because it must be addressed. If it's not addressed, we know where we'll go. The devil refuses to address sin. That's why he is the devil. Okay? So salvation is looking at my sins and realizing that I need, you know, God is addressing it and I need to open up and respond to what he's doing in my life. All he's asking us is to repent and to believe and become a new creation. Okay, <clears throat> so we were um, looking at, you know, creator, okay, creation. Let's mm -hmm. this falls into Easter, um, the Passover well, the Paschal, Easter, recreation. Okay. So we are on uh, Article 228. Mm -hmm. Thus, mm -hmm. the revelation of creation is inseparable from the revelation and the forging of the covenant of the one God with his people. Creation is revealed as the first step toward this covenant, the first and universal witness to God's all-powerful love. And so, the truth of creation is also expressed with growing vigor in the message of the prophets, the prayer of the Psalms, and the liturgy, and in the wisdom sayings of the chosen people. So, um, creation here, the logical anthropology, the dignity of a human being. So creation here is a, it has to be understood in a very, in a, a deeper sense. Okay? Creation in a deeper sense. <laughs> So it's important to, to, to note, to keep in mind, that creation itself is a covenant. Okay? Creation space for this is what God is seeking. He creates us so that we may enter into a relationship of love with him, which we call covenant, okay? Relationship of love. So creation must always be looked at as that space for covenant relationship. That's why you see in the first account of creation, which one of the readings we read on, on, we read on the Easter vigil, is the first reading, the Genesis reading from the very beginning. So the priestly writers basically account how God created. And then they put in the seventh day when God rested. rested to emphasize the importance of covenant relationship. So what is God looking for? What is the nature of this covenant of creation, space for covenant relationship? When God creates us, which is obvious, we become, we are creatures. And we are creatures who have been given so many gifts. But the gift, the greatest gift yeah. given to us is the the creator God. God who creates. The Genesis pictures it as God walking with humans in the garden. 
God is the greatest gift. And with that gift, he gives us so many other gifts, you know, um, expressed in the Garden of Eden, like, you know, the tree of life and so on and so forth. Okay? He gives us all those gifts. But the greatest gift is creator himself. And therefore, because he's creator and he wants relationship with creation, okay? the relationship with his creation, so a creature must adore, worship, give thanks, all those things, again. Okay? It's called worship. So that is the covenant, the covenant of worshiping God. And we know that to worship God is to do His will. That's what we call worship, to do His will. If we go to worship and we're not doing the will of God, we have what we call a golden calf. Okay? We may go to church there, okay? but we may not worship in God. We may have a golden calf because we're not doing the will of God. We're doing our own will. That's the essence of a golden calf. So we go there to do the will of God. So that's what worship is. Okay? So covenant relationship in the Garden of Eden, God tells them, do this, don't do this. Meaning, do my will, not your will. That's how covenant is maintained. Unfortunately, humans did their will instead of the will of God. Okay? Because the evil one constantly promises us what God promises, but according to his promise, his is a quick fix. God takes time. If you want it now, Come to my side. Remember what he told Jesus. All those things belong to me. All you need to do is to bend and worship me. <clears throat> Basically, the devil was telling Jesus, I disobeyed God, disobeyed too. <coughs> Just as he tells us in our sinfulness, I disobeyed, disobeyed. But disobedience will give you all these things. So it's important always to understand creation in this sense. Mm -hmm. Our covenant relationship in creation is to worship God. So God rested on the seventh day. So humans rest okay, to offer worship to God. That's why the Pharisees had taken it too far. Don't do anything because it's rest or whatever. Well, it doesn't mean that when God rests on the seventh day, he doesn't do anything. God continues to sustain creation and being. That's work. So it doesn't mean that God ceased to, ceased to do anything. The rest simply means to worship. To enter into the act of worshiping God. That's why like on Sunday we say don't do survival work. Work is not necessary. But it doesn't mean that don't do work and watch TV all day. <laughs> don't do work in order to do work. The most important work, that of prayer and worship. It's not simply, oh, don't do anything. Okay? okay? Refrain from survival work to do the most important work of worship. So on Sundays, we should pray more <laughs> than any other day. We should pray more. Not just coming to church on Sunday. Okay, that's it. They go to the casinos. <laughs> okay? And even we complain at Mass. Yeah. It's too long. <laughs> 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 it's too long. Okay? But that's the purpose of Sunday. Okay? So there's work that people can do which is not serving work like you know in hospitals. Okay? A person can't get an accident and then they take them to hospital and they say, Oh well Sunday. <laughs> they have no Sundays. Come back tomorrow. Okay? No. Okay. That's necessary work. Mm -hmm. But several work is just uh, not concentrating on worship, but doing everything else. Okay? So when Jesus Christ comes to recreate, now the whole world, the new creation, is Noah's Ark. The new creation is the Ark of the Covenant. The new creation is the Temple. The new creation is the body of Jesus Christ. And in that body, in that new creation, that space we call the humanity of Jesus Christ, we can offer perfect worship and praise to God. 
But the question I have to ask myself as a Christian, do I? Do I? Because that's the meaning of a new creation. The old creation fell from grace. It was distorted by sin. Now the new creation, Christ Jesus, his humanity, to which we are united, offer perfect worship to God. So do we, do I? So that is the creation, okay? covenant creation. So among all the scripture texts about creation, the first three chapters of Genesis occupy a unique place. The first three chapters, okay? The first chapter is the first account of creation. The second chapter is about the second account of creation. Chapter three is about the fall. That is the basis of everything else. Without those three chapters, you can't understand creation, salvation, recreation. So the the inspired authors, yeah, it occupies a unique place. From the from a literary standpoint, these texts may have had diverse <laughs> sources. So usually it's believed, okay, it is believed in those you know Genesis chapters that because uh, for example, how do you account the two stories of creation? Let's just get to the Bible and, and look, okay? I want you to notice something there. We've got the first chapter one of Genesis. Okay, look at verse three. Mm -hmm. Then God said, you see that? Mm -hmm. Verse three, then God said, okay? Look at verse 6. What does it say? Let the bee down in the middle of the water. No, no, verse 6, the beginning of verse 6. Then God said. Uh -huh. Then God said. Mm -hmm. Let's go to verse 9. Then God then said. Then God said. Mm -hmm. Verse 11. Then God, then God said. Verse 14. Then God said. Okay, note that. Verse 20. Then God said. Verse 24. Then God said. <laughs> okay, so you see that. Verse 28, 26. Then God said. Then God said. Uh -huh. Okay, so do you know that? Okay. Now go to chapter 2. Okay, chapter 2. Okay. Go to the first verse, okay? No, no, not the first one. Verse 4. Such is the story of the heavens and the earth at the creation. Mm -hmm. Then we begin the second, the second account. At that time when the... Lord made the earth and the heavens. No, no, no. When the... Lord. Uh-uh. Doesn't say that. What does it say? At the time when the... Lord The Lord God. Uh-huh. You know that. Okay. Then go to um, the, the end of verse 5. The Lord God. You see that? Mm -hmm. Verse 7. The Lord God. Verse 8. The Lord God. Verse 9. The Lord God. Do you notice anything there? You see, in the first account, it simply says, Then God said. In the second account, the Lord God. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Do you notice that? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, you see the difference in language? Yes. Correct. Okay. So, and so it's believed, so just, that's just, just a, a small thing to, to note there. So, it's believed. It's believed that in uh, the way you can account for the doublets, like we call those doublets, you have to have two accounts of one thing, like the first account of creation and the second account of creation. How many times did God create? 
did it once. Mm -hmm. But when you look at these accounts, there are slight variations. Okay? The first account is different from the second account. They are all talking about creation. Even the language itself is different in both accounts. So it's believed that there were four independent traditions. We call them Stran, Stran. Ye, the Yahweh, the Eloist, the Pre, Stle, and the Deuteronomian. Okay? So when you read through the whole Pentateuch, okay, you will see those different things okay, interwoven. The first account of creation, like this one, you recognize that it came from the priestly tradition because it emphasizes the Sabbath. Okay? So when you read the second account, which is not from the priestly tradition, you notice that they don't even talk about God you know, resting. So that's how you know, it was written. So you have so it's independent strands which were interwoven okay, into the whole, we have as the Pentateuch by redactors. What do we call, we call them hagiographers. That's why you notice that in the book of Genesis, or in the, in the other books, you can just see humans coming out of the blue. And so where did this come from? Because the redactors, probably in the writing the final text recognized that that particular part of that tradition probably didn't have much use to bring about what God is revealing and they just cut it so you don't even know how, how they cut it or whatever you just see humans just surfacing you don't know where they are coming from because they are in because of these four independent traditions have you ever read the story of Noah if you, if you read the story of Noah, you may think that it's just one story, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Or when you read the um, story of Joseph, mm -hmm. okay, who was sold in Egypt, you'll see that in the story itself, two brothers are mentioned as the ones who served him. Two different names. It's because they are two different traditions brought together by redactors. Okay? So that's why you can't just go to the Bible and say, okay, this is what it says. So there's, there's so much going on, especially in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Okay? So it needs like, you know, systematic study mm -hmm. to know what, what, what's going on there. Okay? So that's what we are talking about here, okay? that among the scripture texts about creation, the first three chapters of Genesis occupy a unique place. From a literal standpoint, these texts may have had diverse sources. These are the sources. Okay? The first sources believed it to be those. Okay? The inspired authors have placed them at the beginning of scripture to express in their solemn language the truth of creation, its origin and its end in God, in all its order and goodness, the vocation of man, and finally, the drama of sin and the hope of salvation. So look at how it is basically systematically placed here. The inspired authors have placed them at the beginning of scripture to express in their solemn language the truth of creation, meaning its origin, 